Back when I had described to the professor how I felt about my fellow Christians, he responded with the comment, Have you read Jonathan Livingston Siegel? You are describing circling above the flock. I told him I hadn't, but ordered the book on Amazon. I was eager to read any book that could help me understand my new identity and direction in life. When the book arrived and I started reading it, I was a little perplexed, because it was literally about a seagull. It read like a children's book about seagulls. But like being good, there was much more to this book than its title implied. As I trudged through the book's seemingly banal and uninteresting beginning, a hint of its allegory crept into my mind. As I kept reading, suddenly the book exploded into a vibrant allegorical painting whose richness overwhelmed me. I had never read a story that was so symbolic and felt so deeply relevant to my own identity. As I read the story, my mind mapped my own experiences and the entities from my own life to the story's symbols. The flock was the people of the church. Flying was the art and practice of learning and seeking the truth, no matter where it led you. It was something that I felt the people of the church did only on Sundays, and even then only minimally. Feeding was the act of milling around in life and trying to make a living. It was, ironically, what I felt the people of the church spent most of their time on. Their work, their play, and their repeated recitation and rereading of Iron Age dogmas were all almost entirely mindless activities. None of these activities challenged them or taught them anything new. From interacting with them in Sunday school, it seemed like their mental lives were like a dead sea of old ideas that stagnated and mixed together, but very rarely made contact with fresh water. Jonathan had discovered the joy of flying, the joy of learning and flourishing in new ideas and new information, the joy of seeking the truth fully and unabashedly, and when he tried to share this joy with the flock, they banished him. And as I read this passage, I feared that I would suffer the same fate if I tried to share my own insights with the church. Because as you may be surprised to discover, I was still a member of the church, and the church was still the only organization through which I felt I could dependably further my philosophical identity and the philosophical identities of other people, despite being an atheist. My only confidant in this largely Christian landscape was a man who lived hundreds of miles away. I felt like an infiltrator in the church, but they were completely unable to recognize any change in my spiritual identity, despite praying, singing, and speaking with me at length. This was further evidence to me that they were not guided by an omniscient supernatural deity, despite fully believing and proclaiming that they were. No one treated me any differently, and people were still very receptive to my philosophical insights, despite the fact that I knew all of these insights came from a completely atheistic perspective. But just like Jonathan Siegel, I feared that if I shared my full perspective, only social exile and mass misunderstanding awaited me. As for my own theological journey, an idea from Jonathan Livingston Siegel that stood out to me was that we are all ideas in the mind of the great goal, or in other words, that we are all a part of the mind of God. This theological idea is basically a type of panentheism, which can be defined as the belief that all is contained within God. It's compatible with pantheism because it states that everything is God. But in addition to stating that, it also states that everything is contained within God. One reason I found this theology compelling was because of a book I'd read as a soon-to-be graduate student in artificial intelligence called Swarm Intelligence. This book made the argument that intelligence is only meaningful as a social process between multiple entities. It also argued that intelligence is not limited to biological creatures. From these premises, I extrapolated that the universe itself could possibly be thought of as a type of mind. I gained further support for this theology through the book The Hidden Face of God by Gerald Schroeder, which I read despite the fact that, and probably because I felt the book was something the professor would probably disagree with. I wanted to be sure I wasn't walking down my new path blindly and Schroeder's previous book had been so compelling to me that I thought this new book could lend new insights and maybe provide answers to some of the problems that the professor had pointed out. Throughout the book, Schroeder walks through many elaborate biological systems in our bodies to illustrate its illustrious inner workings. 
He argues that such wisdom in biological engineering cannot be explained by gradual evolution due to the lack of transitional fossils and the improbability of random mutations creating the right changes for such wisdom to manifest. Several years later, I discovered why these are fallacious criticisms of gradual evolution, but at this time, I found them quite compelling. Ultimately, Schroeder argues that, due to the deficiencies of gradual evolution, in order for life to have such wisdom in its design, some kind of wisdom must pervade the universe itself. This theological idea is a specific type of panentheism called panpsychism, which can be defined as the belief that everything material, however small, has an element of consciousness. In other words, Schroeder's argument is that the universe itself is conscious. He further bolsters this argument with some interpretations of quantum mechanics that I also discovered were fallacious several years later, but that I also found compelling at the time. In addition to espousing panpsychism, Schroeder also argues for deism in the form of a metaphysical non-thing which must have preceded the physical world. Deism can be defined as the belief in a creator of the universe that does not intervene in the universe after creating it. His argument begins by asserting that before the Big Bang, time and space did not exist. So whatever spawned the Big Bang must have itself been outside of time and space and must have therefore been non-physical and must have therefore been metaphysical. Like his other arguments, I learned several years later that this argument too was fallacious. But also like his other arguments, I found it compelling at the time. As I continued these studies in theology, I began to notice two problems with the stances I was taking. One was that sometimes these stances contradicted each other. For example, deism was not readily compatible with panpsychism because deism implied the creator did not intervene in the physical world and panpsychism implied that the entire physical world was currently guided by a universal consciousness. I remedied this conflict by accepting that all of these positions were just hypotheses and perhaps many or only one or possibly none of them were correct. I had learned my lesson with theism and I did not cling to any one of these hypotheses too strongly. The only unwavering commitment I held now was to finding the truth, no matter what it was. The other problem with some of these beliefs, especially deism and panpsychism, is that sometimes they blurred into theism by asserting or implying that the creator or the universe itself was intelligent. I remedied this conflict by accepting that my atheism itself was, at least at this time, fuzzy, in that I still strongly entertain the possibility of an intelligence that either preceded or pervaded the entire universe. Having satisfied myself that I had taken the time to appreciate more arguments for theology, and even the possibility of a more advanced form of theism, I focused my studies once more on reading the books meant to dismantle the arguments for conventional Christian theism.